Android Netrunner is Fantasy Flight Games reimagining of Richard Garfield's classic card game of cyberpunk corporate greed and hacking. In Netrunner, two players face off. One of them is a mega corporation looking to advance hidden agendas, and the other player is a runner looking to bring that corporation down. Each game plays out in 45 to 60 minutes, and this is a living card game, which means that every month a new expansion is released with three copies of 20 unique cards. Now, each of these expansions is really tailored to a specific faction or playstyle, so you can select which ones you want to use and build up your deck in the way that you'd like. At the start of Netrunner, each player chooses their side, corporation or runner, and then builds a deck of about 45 cards around their favorite faction. The credits and tokens are laid out on the table, and each player starts with an identity card, a draw pile, and five credits. They then draw a starting hand of five cards, and the game begins. On their turn, each player has access to a certain number of time units, or clicks. The corporation has three, but they can draw a card at the beginning of their turn, and the runner has four. Now, clicks can be used for a variety of things. They can be used to draw a card, to gain a credit, to place a card in their play area, or to play a single use card, so an event or an operation. Clicks can also be used to activate certain abilities on cards that are already in your play area. Corporations can install four different types of cards. Assets and agendas are installed in remote servers to the left of your identity card, or HQ. Assets are going to boost your resources and abilities, while agendas are scored in order to win the game. So each agenda has an advancement cost, which is equal to the number of advancement tokens that must be placed on it before it can be scored. And it also has a value in agenda points. The first player to score seven agenda points in the game wins. Upgrades are installed on remote servers, HQ, R&D, which is the corporation's draw pile, or the archives, which is the corporation's discard pile. Now, upgrades boost cards that are already in those servers. Ice can be placed as a defense on any one of those servers as well. Now, each piece of ice has a power level, a subtype, and a list of subroutines that the runner has to break through in order to get the server behind the ice. All corporation cards are installed face down and must be activated by resing. The corporation can res assets, agendas, and upgrades by paying their res cost and then turning them over, either at the start of their turn or just after they've completed an action. Now, ice can only be resed during a run. The corporation can also spend their clicks to spend a credit and place an advancement token on an agenda, to trash a tagged runner's resources, or to purge virus counters. At the end of their turn, the corporation discards down to five cards. Runners can install hardware, programs, or resources into their rig by paying the install cost. Hardware and resources are used to boost up a runner's skills and abilities, whereas programs like viruses or icebreakers are used to attack the corporation's servers. Now, a runner can't install programs with a memory cost greater than their current memory capacity. At the core of the runner's turn is the run, in which they're going to attack one of the corporation's servers in order to steal agendas and destroy assets and upgrades. Now, a runner triggers a run by spending a click, choosing their target, and then approaching the outermost piece of ice. And at this point, the corporation can choose to res that ice, which means the runner must defeat its subroutines before moving off. So an icebreaker can only interact with a piece of ice that is equal to its level or lower. Also, some icebreakers have a specific subtype, and that means they can only interact with pieces of ice with the same subtype. Now, subroutines can be broken in any order, and any unbroken subroutine is triggered. If a runner takes net or meat damage from a subroutine, then they must discard a number of random cards from their hand equal to the amount of damage done. Brain damage is also going to force you to discard cards, as well as permanently lowering your hand limit by one card. If at any point a runner either has to discard more cards than they have, or has their hand limit reduced below zero, then they're flatlined and they lose the game. So after passing each piece of ice, the runner has the choice to either continue or run away. 
If the runner makes it to the server, they get to look at the cards that are there, immediately score any agendas, and they can pay the trash cost to get rid of anything else. Now, the only way the runner can get agendas is by stealing them from the corporation. A run on HQ, or R&D, lets the runner see one card out of the corporation's hand or their draw pile. A run on the archives allows the runner to see all of the cards that are in the corporation's discard pile. If a runner completely empties the corporation's R&D, then they win the game. Now, some card effects and actions will give a runner a tag marker. A tagged runner is more susceptible to the events triggered by certain cards, and they can also have their resources trashed by the corporation. A runner can choose to spend any number of their clicks to get rid of tag markers. Now, a runner can take multiple runs during their turn. Each of one of them just costs a click. And once all of their actions are completed, they discard down to their hand limit and the next round begins. So my favorite thing about Netrunner by far is the uniqueness and the customizability of the decks. I like deck building a lot. I love building army lists and all that kind of optimization and sort of pre-planning strategy. So this really, really feeds that desire. Um, I mean, the base game comes with four corporation decks and three for the runners, and they're all unique. There's some corporations that are great at dealing damage. There's some that are great at raking in money or tagging the runner and the balance is similar within the runner deck. So you can choose a strategy and just run with it and see how it goes, or you can try to balance out your deck in all kinds of interesting ways, which is a lot of fun that you can have before the game has even started. I also really like the asymmetry of the playing styles. Um, the fact that the runner and the corporation have such different resources at their disposal and have such different ways of doing things means that it's hard for the game to get stale because even if you get tired of playing as one side, and you feel like you really mastered the strategies for, say, the runner, then you just flip over and start playing as the corporation, and all of a sudden it's an entirely different game, which is very, very cool. Now, one problem that I do have with this game is similar to a lot of card games where the randomness of the card draws can mess with your strategy in ways that can be a little hard to adapt to. You can have a great deck built, you can have a great plan, and then you draw a really bad hand of cards and your turn is a bit of a blowout, which can be frustrating for certain players. I also found that while the theme of this game is engaging and well-realized, the amount of jargon they packed into it and the uniqueness of all of the terminology they used actually gets in the way of learning the rules. Um, it's one thing to have to learn an entire game system, it's quite another to have to remember that the runners cards go into a heap while the corporation's cards go into an archive and one side has a grip and one side has an HQ and you've got all of these words that you can't really attach to coherent things and I, I found it a little bit frustrating even though once I got into the gameplay it was not that hard to follow. So another potential con to this game is uh, it is a card game, there's no boards involved here, and it can get quite complex in the amount of stuff that you're going to have in front of you, different cards are going to be laid out in specific ways, it's going to take some organization on your part. Now, this seems like the kind of game that probably could have benefited from some kind of play mat <laughs> or something, so you could lay things out in a really well-organized way and you didn't have to battle with that, because that is, that is difficult, it is complicated for a card game. To, to ask you to do that. <laughs> However, I really like Android Netrunner. Um, one of the problems that's been mentioned is the fact that the, uh, the, technology, the, the technology is named in a particular way that can make it difficult to understand the rules. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that plays into this beautiful, pervasive theme. I mean, the, the theme in this game is everywhere. It's on every card. The fact that everything's named differently means that you can really get lost in that really beautiful cyberpunk world that's built with this game. And I appreciate the amount of time and effort that went into that. I really like it. Another pro for this game is it is very complex in its strategy for such a fast paced game. It's it's easy to learn once you can get past those terminology pieces. Uh, and it's it's gonna make you think really fast. The strategy's there and yet it's gonna move along really quickly. There's not a lot of downtime. So it means it's got a lot of replayability and you can get through a game quite quickly. 